Welcome everybody in this week's seminar. Today we have a pleasure to, to host Adam Savitsky, who is a like, faculty member in our institute uh, in Warsaw. So Adam, yeah, in the past worked on many topics in mathematical physics, of quantum information, so entanglement theory, especially geometric aspects of it. But in recent years, he was interested in problems of compilation of quantum gates, also unitary designs. And today he'll be telling us about his recent results on random matrix models of uh, approximate T designs. So the, the screen is yours, Adam. Thanks for coming. Okay, thank you, Michal. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and uh, also can see my cursor because it will be kind of important. Uh, okay, so uh, this is uh, these are the results of the joint work with my uh, student uh, Piotr Dulian from the Warsaw University. And the paper appeared uh, on archive just, I think, two or three months ago. So it's quite fresh uh, thing. So uh, the idea for this talk is that I will start with really very basic stuff because I don't want to assume that uh, everyone knows everything about T designs uh, because uh, from my experience, I, I know that uh, this assumption uh, typically uh, makes uh, like uh, the audience not uh, listening to, to what I am uh, saying after five minutes. So let me start really very slowly. Uh, okay, how to change this slide? Okay, good. So I will start with the idea of so-called balanced polynomials on the unitary group. So UD is the, the unitary group in dimension D. And then let's do it slowly on the example of two by two matrices. So we have a matrix U, which is two by two unitary matrix. And then an example of the homogeneous polynomial on this group U2 of degree one, one is given by this function F1 of U. So what does it mean that it's of degree one, one? It means that there is one entry from the matrix U and one entry from the conjugate of this matrix in every term of this polynomial, okay? And so every term is of the same type. It has one entry from U, one entry from U bar, and uh, you have some linear combination of those things. So this will be called balanced polynomial of degree one, one. Okay, so how to uh, produce all the possible polynomials which are balanced and of degree one, one. So if we take the tensor product of the matrix U with U bar, you can see that the entries of such a matrix are basically all possible, <clears throat> uh, all possible elementary uh, balanced polynomials. Okay, okay. So now, how can we nicely write down formula for any one-one balanced polynomial on the unitary group? So it should be some linear combination of those entries here. Okay, so it will be some alpha ij and some entries of the matrix, ij entry. And if you write this alpha ij, if you construct a matrix from those coefficients alpha ij, so I will call this matrix A, then this polynomial can be written as a trace of some matrix. This is a matrix of coefficients and then u, u bar. Okay, so these are the balanced polynomial, polynomials of degree one, one. So naturally, you, you can imagine that we can uh, uh, generalize this concept to polynomials of degree, of degree TT, where T will be some integer. Okay, so we take a group to be uh, now U of the uh, unitary group in D dimension, so I do not require it to be uh, uh, U2, and then by HT, I will denote homogeneous polynomials of order TT. So by the same reasoning as on the previous slide, any, any such polynomial can be written as a trace of some big matrix A <clears throat> uh, acting on the Hilbert space, which has dimension D to the power 2T, and then this U tensor T times U bar tensor T. Okay. Uh, so now I want to introduce the concept of a T design. So for this purpose, I need a little bit more notion. So mu in this talk will be always a Haar measure on my group G, so on this unitary group, and it will be normalized Haar measure. So it integrates to one. 
And now by S, I will de uh, denote always a finite subset of elements of this group. So this will be also called uh, finite subset of gates because we will treat those elements of the unitary group as gates. And by new S, I will denote a measure on this group G, which is supported at S. And it is actually kind of a special choice of a measure, uh, just for the purpose of this talk, of course, that every element in this S is equally uh, uh, possible. So uh, uh, new S uh, is one over S. So one, this S also uh, denotes uh, the cardinality of the set. I don't want to introduce too much notation. So S is a set, is also the number of elements in the set. So you can uh, actually deduce what I mean when I'm writing one over S, it means that this is the number of elements because one over S as a set does not make any sense. Okay, so new S is my measure supported at S. And then I'm saying that this S with this measure new S is a T design or an exact T design if for any polynomial, balanced polynomial of degree TT, taking the average with respect to this measure new S is the same as taking the average with respect to the R measure on the entire group. Okay, so this is the definition of the uh, of an exact T design. Uh, good. And now just to capture this idea a little uh, nicer. So uh, first of all, UTT will be the abbreviation for this U tensor T times U bar tensor T because it will appear very often. So just to save some space. And now <clears throat> uh, we I will introduce two operators. So the operator T new ST, this one here, oh, sorry. Uh, it's just a sum one over S UTT over the elements from my set S, which is supposed to form a T design. And then there is an operator which uh, mm, is this UTT, and, but averaged over the Haar measure. Okay, so why I'm taking this UTT? Because this matrix UTT encodes all elementary balanced T comma T polynomials, homogeneous polynomials, okay? And now, <clears throat> basically, uh, what I am doing next is I introduce some distance between those two operators. Of course, if my set S is a perfect design, those two operators are identical because those averages should uh, agree for any polynomial of degree TT uh, mm -hmm. by definition. Okay, but now I want to measure somehow the distance between uh, those two operators in order to capture how well some set imitates an exact T design. So I introduce this norm, which is the norm of, of the difference of T nu ST and T mu T. So one is with respect to my set and one is with respect to the Haar measure. And this is the operator norm. So the distance between this operator norm is some number between zero and one. And then I am saying that my, so this is another way of phrasing that something is an exact design. If this delta is zero, so basically, if those two operators are exactly the same, then uh, my set is, or actually my measure, is a, a, an exact T design. And when it is uh, bigger than zero, but strictly less than one, I'm saying that this is uh, some delta approximate T design. Okay. Uh, good. So this is some... Uh, uh, this is some introduction to, uh, to, this was an introduction to T designs. And now um, why this, uh, this, uh, this thing, this delta new ST is a useful thing. So for example, first of all, if I take any polynomial, uh, which is uh, of degree TT, okay, and then I want to, uh, calculate what is the difference between the average of this polynomial with respect to my measure and with respect to the Haar measure. Then if you do a little bit of manipulation and you use the definition of the func of the polynomial, it can be written in this way, then you immediately see that uh, 
it is bounded from above by this number delta and the first norm of the matrix A. For example, you can write it slightly different using different uh, norms, but if I want to use delta, this will be the relation. So if delta is very small, I know that for every polynomial, I have this uh, kind of bound. Okay, of course, T designs are uh, this thing that T designs uh, uh, capture behavior of the Haar measure for some polynomial functions uh, uh, have a lot of uh, applications in the quantum uh, information and uh, in particular in quantum computing, especially ra in randomized uh, benchmarking, quantum state discrimination, complexity growth. These are some kind of new uh, applications. Uh, and also uh, something I was actually doing for some time ago in the criteria for University of Quantum Gates, but I don't want to spent a lot of time discussing those applications because this talk is not about this. Uh, let me maybe also mention about some open, open problems. So uh, the question, uh, which is one uh, big open problem actually in mathematics is whether this delta nu s defined as the supremum over all t's. So I'm, uh, I can calculate this delta nu s t for polynomials of uh, larger and larger degree. And then the question, I know that all of them, if I start with a universal set, all those numbers, delta nu st for any t, they will be strictly less than one. However, one may be an accumulation point of this, okay? So in the limit, uh, this supremum might be equal exactly one. And the question is uh, when, uh, this is actually strictly less than one because it when it is strictly less than one, a lot of nice things can be shown about such such sets uh, in terms of uh, like their properties as generators of random walks on uh, on compact groups and so on. So that's why mathematicians are interested in this subject. So there are some partial results which states that uh, these are results by Burgain and Kambur. So the first paper in the 2008 was about SU2 and the other one in uh, 2011 was about uh, SUD for NED. That uh, when I have a set of matrices such that uh, every matrix has, uh, mm, every, uh, every matrix has, every matrix uh, has algebraic entries, then uh, I, uh, uh, I can say that delta nu s is strictly less than one. So this is not uh, a result which is constructive. It doesn't give you a bound how uh, it is uh, separated uh, from one. It just gives you a statement that if you have such a set with algebraic entries, mat matrices with al algebraic entries, then this delta nu s is uh, strictly less than one. I will come back to this problem because we also have some uh, nice, uh, at least I think, nice approach to this, to somehow showing something uh, similar, not only for algebraic entries. Okay, so, but before I, I move on, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, because we have these operators, yes, this operator T nu S T and the operator T nu T. So T nu T is actually boring operator because this is just a projection. But this one is an interesting object. And what we are asking is the spectral, we are asking about the operator norm of, of, this, of, this, op of this operator, basically. And this is uh, more or less nothing else but the largest eigenvalue. So one can ask uh, uh, some questions about the spectrum of this operator, okay? And in particular about the spectral measure. Okay, so let me briefly remind you what is actually the spectral measure of a matrix. So if I have N by N Hermitian matrix, uh, so then it has some spectrum. I can number it uh, in the increasing order. And let's assume that all those eigenvalues can be put into some box, which is between minus L and L. And this L, this capital L does not depend on N, okay? So I have a sequence of Hermitian matrices, the dimension is growing. However, the spectrum of every matrix is between L and minus L. Then for any interval uh, AB, 
I define a spectral measure of this interval to be one over n, and then the number of eigenvalues which are in this uh, in this interval. Okay, so this is a very natural definition of a spectral measure. And uh, now the interesting object for for for, such, for for any measure actually are the moments of this measure. So for any uh, fixed n, I can define the nth moment of the spectral measure of H n to be this this kind of an integral. So in our case. This integral means nothing else but taking the eigenvalues to the power m and then summing them and dividing by one over n. So this is given by this formula. Okay. And then if there is, it might happen that there is a measure, I will denote it by uh, sigma with the index h, uh, which is supported between minus l and l such that this mo those moments when the dimension of the when the dimension of my sequence is growing when h n is when n goes to infinity for h n then the moments converges to some finite numbers okay so if this is the case then any average of any continuous function with respect uh, to those uh, 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 to, with respect to, to measures uh, uh, sigma h n will converge to the averages with respect to this uh, uh, measure sigma h, this limiting measure. Okay, so let's uh, see what we can say uh, about the spectral measure. So this was just some recap of, uh, of uh, properties of spectral measures. So actually I defined the spectral measure. I didn't do any, anything else. So how those spectral measures looks like, look like uh, in our case. <clears throat> so uh, we will assume that we have two, uh, uh, actually we will assume first uh, the, the situation where the set which we take from the unitary group is some fixed number of elements of the unitaries UN and their differences. I do not assume that they are random whatsoever. This I, I've chosen them and they are fixed. I don't care how, uh, how they were chosen. And then by SK, I will denote words of the length K built out of this, uh, mm, out of this, uh, out of this alphabet. Of course, there should be also some, uh, okay. Good, and now the sequence which I want to consider is the operator T nu S T, okay? From T equal one to infinity. So it will, so the role which was played previously by N is now played by T, okay? So now I can define the nth moment of this, uh, of the measure associated with, of the spectral measure of this operator, which will be denoted by Sigma S T with the index m here. So this is just a trace of this operator taken to the power m and divided by the dimension of the space on which the operator acts. So one can write it like this, where the sum is taken over all the words of length m. And this wmtt is this word take tensor product it, uh, with itself t times and then the a conjugate of the word tensor product t times. Okay, so this is, a, I have this nice formula for the nth moment of my measure, and I will be actually interested uh, about those moments in the limit when t, go, t goes to infinity. Yes, so the dimension of this operator's, operator goes to infinity. So first let's do the simple calculation. So I will just take some unitary matrix from the unit, my unitary group. And basically I want to calculate what is one over D to the power to T and then this trace. So I'm doing this trace for some unitary. Okay, so uh, this is basically one over D to the power to T and then the trace of my matrix U taken to the power to T. But the trace of a unitary matrix is just the sum of its eigenvalues, and those eigenvalues lie in a circle. So surely, if all those, if the matrix is not proportional to the identity matrix, in the limit I will get zero. 
And when it is proportional to the identity matrix, I will get one. Okay, so basically the moments of my spectral measure for this operator, when T goes to infinity, they converge to one over SM. This is what we have here. And then it's the trace of this thing. So whenever this WM is not a spelling of identity of, or something proportional to identity, but I, we can limit ourselves to identity because I will assume uh, one more thing about uh, this set S in a minute and some over the spellings of the identity of the length M. So if we are able to count those spellings of identity, we can uh, provide formulas for those moments, okay? And this additional assumption, which I uh, see I didn't put on the slide is that S is a free group. So there are no relations between those generators. If there are no relations between generators, uh, I cannot have the only thing which can appear here is not something proportional to identity, but exactly identity. Okay, so I have to count spellings of the identity, and this problem was actually solved long time ago because this the number of the spellings of identity is actually the number of walks of length m that begin and end at the sum vertex of a, of an s regular tree. So here I, 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 I draw a tree for a case when I have just two generators and their inverses. So inverses are the same as the con as uh, Hermitian conjugates. So uh, basically, uh, for example, if I have something like this, that uh, I start with U1 and then I'm going back with U1 dagger, this is the spelling of the identity of length two, yes? But I can also have something like U1 U2, and then I'm coming back with U2 and U1, okay? So I have to count such closed paths. Uh, it's not a really difficult problem in combinatorics to count such paths. So here is the formula. Of course, when M is odd, there is no spelling of identity because to spell the identity, I need to have the same number of inverses as the number of elements because there are no relations between those unitaries which I'm considering. Okay, so I have the formula for moments, and now we can ask, is there a measure such that the moments of this measure, completely supported measure on, on a line, such that the moments of this measure are exactly the same as those moments when t goes to infinity. Okay, and this question was answered by Keston in the 60s. Uh, and this measure is known as keston mckay measure and is given by this formula. So it is a measure which is, which is supported between minus delta opt and delta opt. So this is a support of this measure. And then it's, uh, it has some formula here. Okay, so just because of this reasoning, one can quickly uh, understand that this delta nu s, so this supremum over all t's, of the norm of a matrix T nu S T cannot be uh, smaller than this optimal value. Yes, because the spectrum of the matrix in the limit when T goes to infinity is supported in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, interval. Okay. Uh, sorry, Adam, can you uh, just this last part, can you, <clears throat> I got just lost on this conclusion that uh, Support has to be, uh, yeah, that. Uh, okay, yeah, so, on this conclusion, support, so if you take this matrix, this limiting matrix T nu S when T go, do, do, goes yeah. to infinity, it will have a spectrum which is uh, supported between minus delta opt and delta opt. Yes, yeah. and there is non zero measure for every number of this, uh, for, for any extremely small interval in the vicinity of inside of sure, this. Sure, of okay, this delta opt at this point is just a parameter. Just it's just a parameter a, which is given yeah. by this formula, sure. yes? So basically, this, the norm of the matrix, this of this matrix T nu S, when T goes to infinity, must right, be, has to be in this, yeah. At least okay. this, this parameter. Basically, this is what I wanted to say. Okay, so I did this derivation, assuming that at the beginning, we are given a set, of unitaries and their inverses, okay? I can repeat similar reasoning 
when we only are given a set without inverses. Okay, but then I have to do this reasoning not for spectrum, but for the singular values of the matrix. So basically for the roots of uh, uh, the eigenvalues of this operator, T nu S T, T nu S T star. Okay. I don't want to waste time for repeating all the all of this, but you can do it. And then you will find out that those uh, uh, singular values of uh, of this uh, matrix, when you don't have inverses, they are given by very similar formula. So two is missing here. And uh, of course, it's now supported between zero and delta opt because singular values are all positive. Uh, the reasoning is really very similar. You have to do some changes of variables, etc. Mm -hmm. So summing up, okay, now, what we can say that in both settings, when we have inverses and we don't have inverses, and having this assumption that our group is free, so here we assume that S is free, and here that S, we after adding uh, inverses is free, so these are the assumptions, then the singular values of both operators, this one and this one, they uh, are their distribution in the limit when T goes to infinity is given by this formula, this uh, Okay, but now what happens when actually the number of, gener of generators, so the cardinality of this set S goes, uh, grows, then when you look at the formula for delta opt, so this two times root of S minus one divided by S, it will converge to zero. So this measure will, the support of this measure will shrink to zero, which is something, uh, uh, not really what we want to see, because uh, if the support of this measure shrinks to zero, it will be very hard to study the limiting behavior of the largest eigenvalue. So we need to do some rescaling. And we do this rescaling multiplying this operator by root of s. So I rescale it by the root of the number of the generators, okay? So if I change the variables here, okay? using this, uh, this fact that I, I'm rescaling my operator. So y is now the, uh, this, uh, this new variable y, it corresponds to the square of the singular value. Uh, sorry, not square of the singular value, but the root of s times the singular value. Then we can see that actually uh, the support of the measure is no longer going to zero when S goes to infinity. It's, it's actually this measure when S goes to infinity, it converges to the quarter circle measure. So this is the measure of the uh, of the singular values for uh, uh, some uh, random matrix assembles which are uh, well studied, okay? So this change of variables gives us this convergence. But look, the fact that we know now that the singular values of this operator, they converge to some uh, quarter circle law, means uh, gives us actually no definite information about what is happening with the norm of this operator of, or with the distribution of the largest singular value. Because for example, if I take Gaussian unitary ensemble and Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, for both of them, when n goes to infinity, the singular values are distributed according to the quarter circle, quarter circle law. But the distribution of the norm in both cases is different. It is, it, in both cases, it is, of course, in the limit tracy widom but with different parameters beta. So this uh, uh, information which we already uh, have, which we already have about the behavior of the spectrum, actually of the bulk spectrum, uh, doesn't give us full information about the uh, behavior of the norm. And the norm is something we want to study. So for this- uh, reason, Sorry, Adam, can I just ask if I understand? Because, okay, if, if I uh, just make sure if I understand you. So just this reasoning, you can just repeat for any set of generators that, don't have any relations among them. And exactly. you'll have this uh, qualitative behavior that the spectral measure would be just converging to the specific measure, just given given in terms of cardinality. Uh, exactly. of, uh, mm -hmm. Right. And then 
but unfortunately this is not the the quantity uh like the support of this measure is not precisely quantity uh, one exactly is. exactly because so for example i don't know when we even we when, when we have GUE, for example, I guess uh, yeah. you, this example will be familiar for you. Then the spectrum is between minus two and two in the yeah. limit, but yeah. there is non-zero probability that the norm of uh, uh, of this matrix will actually be bigger than two. It doesn't have to be two exactly. Yeah. So sure. uh, maybe it's, uh, if I remember well, it doesn't. Yeah, match, match, maybe not remember so like I remember it well, but it's like those are small fluctuations. In that exactly. exactly. But so there are other models where there can be big fluctuations, actually. Mm -hmm. So basically, I will be interested in those fluctuations in the remaining part of the talk, but sure. no. Okay, good. Thanks. So now uh, to do something more. Uh, I need to introduce a little bit more stuff because I want to write down this op operator in a block diagonal form. And for this purpose, I need some representation theory. So first of all, the this uh, map which maps U to UTT is a representation of the unitary group. One can check that this is actually homomorphism. So now we actually know quite a lot about the representations of the unitary group. They can be labeled by sequences of D if we are in the dimension D, then these are the sequences of D non-increasing in, non integers. I will denote them by lambda. And uh, <clears throat> uh, a little bit of notation. I know that it's maybe a lot of notation, but uh, uh, by pi lambda, I will denote the, the representation which corresponds to this sequence uh, uh, denoted by lambda and then sigma of lambda will be the sum of those lambda elements and sigma plus will be will be the subsequence of positive integers in lambda so what is maybe not uh, very kosher in my approach is that uh, i do not insist that those lambdas are actually sequences of positive integers they can be also uh, they just have to be non-increasing that's uh, uh, so, for example, if I have u3, I can have lambda, which is 3, 1, minus 1, okay? So then the sum is 3, uh, lambda plus is the subsequence of positive, so 3, 1, and uh, the sum of the positive things is 4, okay? So now, uh, one can ask the question, what are the irreducible representations which appear in the decomposition of u tensor t, u tensor, u bar tensor t? Okay, so in this in in the decomposition of this representation, and using my notation, the answer is very simple. This will they will be labeled by those lambdas, uh, so the sequences of non-increasing integers of the length d, such that the sum of elements in the sequence lambda is zero, and the sum of the positive elements is not bigger than t. Okay, so let's do some example. So if I, for example, take U3 and I want to have all the, and I want to label all the representations which appear in U tensor two times U bar tensor two. So this will be the sequences such that, okay, the positive numbers, they cannot add up to something bigger than two. So for example, I can have a sequence two, zero minus two. So the sum of the elements is zero and the sum of the positive elements is two. I can have two minus one minus one, then minus, then one, one minus two, okay? So look, they all add up to zero. The positive part is maximally two. And now I can also have the, a situation when the positive uh, uh, the elements which are positive in the sequence sum up to one. So it will be one, zero minus one. And the trivial representation, of course. Uh, Okay, I assumed here that lambda should be different than zero, so erase this trigger one. Okay, so and now uh, actually using this uh, coding of representations, I can answer uh, important questions because we know that if we have irreducible representation, or actually any representation, it doesn't have to be irreducible. It has a it has a type. It can be either real, complex, or, or quaternionic, and now. 
looking at this lambda, I can immediately decide what is the type of the representation. So let's define the operation, which is lambda star. So I take this sequence and I put star, and it means read the lambda from the end to the beginning and put minuses, okay? So if lambda star is equal to lambda, then the representation is real. And <clears throat> if lambda star is not equal to lambda, the representation is complex. There will be no quaternionic representations appearing in this decomposition. This is also an important information, okay? And also for every complex representation, I will have a conjugate representation to it, which is uh, uh, which is uh, just given. So the entries of this of the of those matrices are just, are just complex conjugate conjugates of of the entries of of pi lambda. Okay, good. So we know how to label the representations appearing in the decomposition of u tensor t, u bar tensor t. And we also can say something about the type of the types of those representations. So now for every representation, I can define the operator. So I start with my set S and the, this measure, which is associated with this set. And I have operators T nu S lambda. So this is basically the same thing which I was defining uh, previously, but it's for the fixed representation lambda. And <clears throat> I can also have uh, the same thing T mu lambda. So then it is the average of pi lambda over the entire group with respect to their hard measure. This is basically zero whenever lambda is non-trivial representation. And in this lambda T, I excluded the trivial representations. Okay. So now using this two definitions and this decomposition, I can write my operators T nu S T and T mu T as a direct sum of operators for um, irreducible representations appearing in the decomposition of UTT. So I'm doing it. And now when I subtract those two things, the trivial representations in both operators are the same. So they cancel. And what I am left with is that the norm of this difference is nothing else but the norm of the block diagonal matrix where blocks are labeled by lambdas, uh, so by non-trivial representations appearing in the decomposition of UTT. And of course, for the block diagonal matrix, the norm is the supremum of the over the norms of the blocks. So I get this nice formula. So that delta nu st is basically the supremum over lambdas of delta nu s lambda. Okay, good. Okay, so now what problem I want to consider uh, in the remaining time? I still have 20 minutes, it's quite a lot. Okay, so <clears throat> we want to consider two types of uh, sets. So I will have either S, which is just N elements taken from the unitary group in dimension D, but those unitaries are taken at random with respect to the Haar measure. So there is some particular ways of choosing them. And then the other set I will consider is the same, but I also add inverses. Okay, and the question we are asking is what we can say about the tail probability. So I, let's say I fix some delta and I want, of course, between zero and one. And I ask what is the probability that for such randomly chosen set, this delta is bigger than this delta. I want to bound the tail probability for this. Okay, and of course, Using the union, I can use the union bound for this purpose. So, for example, I can uh, uh, I can write that this probability, this tail probability, is bounded by the sum over lambdas which uh, appear in the uh, the composition of my operator, and then the tail probabilities for the uh, blobs which are uh, labeled by lambda. Okay. So basically, this will be the object I will deal with. Uh, next. Okay, so now there is the first result which we have, and this result says something about limiting behavior. So, uh, look, we already know that it's a good idea to rescale our operator T nu S lambda by root of S. Okay, and then uh, if we want to consider a T design, 
course, we take the sum over lambdas, which appear in the decomposition, okay? And what is happening when S actually grows uh, to infinity or S is large? So we want to understand what is the limiting behavior of this matrix. So T is fixed and number of generators is now growing. And then what we can show is that this converges to a, another block diagonal matrix where blocks will be just labeled by T lambda. So I remove this notion of new S from this uh, point here because S goes to infinity and this is the limiting operator, okay? And then I can actually say what are the blocks T lambda in this case. So remember that S uh, is a special set. It's a set of hard random unitaries or hard random unitaries with the inverses. And now I'm considering the big size of this, uh, the, the limit of the big size of this set. So now those T lambdas are either real or complex Ginebra uh, matrices whenever, mm, so uh, whenever, when I don't have inverses, then this will be those uh, Ginebra ensembles. And this will be real when lambda is a real representation and complex when the lambda is a complex representation. And in the case when my set S is symmetric, so it has also inverses, those blocks will be Gaussian orthogonal uh, matrices or Gaussian unitary matrices. Mm. Of course, properly scaled. So they are scaled in a way that their spectrum is between minus two and two, or sigma values are between, um, uh, singular values are between uh, zero and uh, root two. Okay, so now uh, I don't want to speak about the proof of this theorem. It's actually, uh, it might seem to be uh, uh, complicated to prove something like this, but uh, just to give us, comment, it's a combination of two things, uh, of orthogonality relations for the matrix elements in the irreducible representations and the central limit theorem. So it's basically just two simple concepts combine, give you this result. And then when I have this limiting object, I can forget about my starting operator for a moment, and I can study some properties of this limiting object, okay? So for example, I want to ask, uh, I can ask the question about <clears throat> uh, norm of those, uh, uh, norm of the, of, of the fixed block which appears in this operator or the norm of uh, the whole block diagonal matrix or what is happening uh, when I'm considering larger and larger operators. So when T goes to infinity, so in the limit when S and T goes to infinity. Okay, so these are the questions we can try to answer. Because Why we can try to answer them? Because uh, they are now, uh, they, they now concern objects which are well studied. Those blocks T lambda, these are some standard, uh, uh, standard, uh, mm, standard random, uh, random matrices. So then uh, there is a lot of things known for them and we can, we can use them. So basically, um, okay, maybe I will skip this and I will just say that when we have a, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm basically using some uh, rather old results of uh, Abrun and Sharek uh, that uh, concern um, the norm of a GOE, GUE, or, or a real Ginebra, complex Ginebra matrices in fixed dimension. This is actually quite important that those results are true uh, in some fixed dimensions, that these are not the results which are the limiting ones when n goes to infinity, because our blocks are finite dimensional. So uh, I don't want to, I cannot treat all those blocks with Tracy Weedom because Tracy Weedom is uh, the thing which uh, appears when n goes to infinity. I, I want to have some concrete bounds in any finite dimension for those uh, uh, GOE, GUE uh, matrices. And these bounds uh, <coughs> are given, uh, can be derived uh, by some nice reasoning given by Abrun and Sharek uh, in uh, 
and uh, they are actually exponential. So if I want to ask what is the probability that the norm is bigger than two by epsilon, then the scales, uh, uh, the tail of uh, probability for this scales with the exponentially with the dimension of a matrix and with the epsilon square. There are some factors here which are actually not really very relevant. Okay. Okay, so now what is the probability that delta of t is bigger than two plus epsilon? So I will apply this. Uh, 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 would... mm -hmm. I forgot the name for this uh, union bound. Sorry. So I am applying the union bound because delta t is basically the supremum over deltas for fixed lambdas. So I am applying the union bound. So I am actually summing up those uh, exponents given by these formulas. By in but instead of the n, I'm putting the dimension of the representation. And then it's there is some i lambda, which indicates whether representation is real, complex, and whether the set is symmetric or uh, non-symmetric. OK? So look, for example, I want to have some concrete formulas. So in order to produce, produce concrete formulas, I need to be able to somehow uh, control the dimension of the representation. This is the first thing. And I also want to control the number of lambdas which appear in this sum, OK? Because I'm si summing of those uh, 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 over those lambdas. Okay, so we actually uh, derived a nice bound for the dimension of the representation. So the here is this bound. So when d is bigger than two k, so if I take lambda from lambda t, then the first norm of this lambda. So if I sum up the modules of the elements of the sequence lambda. This sum cannot be bigger than 2t. So let's say that it's equal to k, where k is smaller than t. OK, so then if I consider d, which is bigger than 2k, I have this bound. And when uh, d is uh, smaller than 2k, I have the other bound. Uh, so Maj, uh, Maj, who is sick, uh, and uh, ah, is it obvious? Uh, okay, uh, so, it so is he obvious. ask a question. Uh, yes, yeah. I can see this question because I just uh, saw that uh, it is obvious that this is two k margin because of the fact that the sequence lambda is such that it sums up to zero. Yes, and uh, the num the positive part of the sequence sums up to k. So it means that okay, good. Uh, and this is because our representations are the representations of U of U tensor T times U bar tensor T. If, the, if those, uh, if T for U and for U bar is different, then uh, those sequences wouldn't be balanced and so on. But such a nice phenomenon happens here. Okay. <clears throat> and now, uh, what is the number of distinct irreducible representations pi lambda, which have fixed first norm 2k because i can now sum if i if if i want to do this sum i will do it over k yes over k equal 1 2 3 up to t and this can be bounded by the number of partitions of k squared okay and for the number of partitions of uh, of k i can take uh, so i took it from some number theory paper some concrete bound uh, so do you know that uh, Krzysiek Pawłowski uh, and Kazik Zonzowski sometimes use it uh, in some? Yes, exactly. exactly. I know it. Uh, good. So we have this, this bound for the partition number. So doing this sum basically means sum it over k from 1 to t. Uh, multiply, uh, for every k, multiply it by this number because there is uh, this number of elements with a fixed k and then put into exponents instead of d lambda those bounds here of course uh, coming back for this d lambda we could also put here uh, vial dimension formulas but putting those y dimension formulas we have no control over this sum because they are too complicated and doing this sums will be very difficult with this that's why we invented those bounds okay 
Making the long story short, what we do is, first of all, we can do this uh, summation, and actually we can do this sum summation uh, from t equal one, from k equal one to, to infinity. So basically, uh, this, this, this is over all possible t's, and this sums up nicely to some exponential tail, uh, which is vanishing quite quickly when epsilon is uh, is, uh, is is big uh, uh, is uh, of order uh, one or two something like this if you look at the formula you will see so that the epsilon of the order one already gives you here a small uh, small value and actually also if the dimension is bigger it's even better uh, which is somehow clear it should be like this because of some concentration of measure phenomena in the large dimension. Okay, so we have this bound uh, for the probability that delta in our model is bigger than two plus epsilon. So here I have some uh, um, elementary uh, derivation of this bound uh, in, case, in case when we are in the dimension two. So for qubit, because then uh, it can be actually done explicitly without any bounds because we have the formula, which is quite easy for the dimension of the representation. And uh, uh, there is only one one representation for each case. So this kind of a summation, which we have here, can be done explicitly. This is just a geometric series. Okay, and then going with T to infinity just kills the term here. So we have this formula for... Uh, for the for the case of a qubit, okay, and this is the general result which we have when we are doing this summation <clears throat> according to the strategy I described two slides ago in any dimension. Okay, good. So now, what can we actually infer from uh, from this? So one of the things uh, which uh, I want to refer to is uh, so one can ask actually. If uh, what is uh, if uh, this thing about uh, um, okay so maybe so these are those tail tails tail bounds so now I want to um, say a little bit about the behavior of this delta t so basically uh, we want to ask the question if there is a t such that Delta is equal to delta t, the delta of t. Okay, so delta is the, is the supremum over all delta t's, but this supremum might be uh, achieved for some finite t. Okay, and this is basically the question: if this is the case in uh, for for our model. Sorry, I have to close some. You know, okay, so for this purpose, I need to introduce a concept of uh, infinitely and finitely often. This is actually some basic concept in probability theory, but I have to admit that I learned this thing only like, I don't know, half and uh, six or seven months ago when I was teaching in China students' probability theory. And one of the subject was actually about this. And then I, uh, I somehow learned it for, for the first time in my life which might indicate that I'm not actually well educated, but anyway, but this is a very nice concept. So we have a probability space, okay? And then we consider some sequence of events. Uh, this is the sequence AN, and we say that those events occur infinitely often if AN occurs for infinite number of indices in uh, uh, indices N, okay? So AN I dot O, are all those elementary events omega such that a n that, that omega belongs to a n for infinite number of indices, and then finitely often is the same thing, but it belongs to a n for at most finite number of indices. Okay, and now when I have a sequence of events. I do not assume anything about the independence of those uh, events in the sequence whatsoever. So I just have an infinite sequence of events. And then if the sum of the probabilities for those events uh, is uh, finite, then I can say that probability that the an uh, happens 
finitely often is equal to one. This is a very nice uh, result, which is actually the first borel cantelli lemma. Then there is some second uh, lemma, which treats the case when this is infinite and events are independent, but we don't know. Uh, we don't need this thing. This is the, 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 the thing which we, which we need. Okay. So now, uh, look, I can take by, so I need a sequence of events. So now my sequence of, of events is A lambda, and this is uh, the event that delta of lambda, so delta for some, uh, for my uh, irreducible representation lambda, is bigger than two plus epsilon. Okay, so I consider such a sequence of events. I know already that the, if I sum up those probabilities uh, P A lambda, they will sum up to something uh, which is finite. This is because of the calculation which I already did. This thing here is a bound exactly for this sum. Okay, so it is finite, which means that using this borel cantelli lemma, I know that A lambda, probability that A lambda uh, happens finitely often is exactly one. Okay, so what does it mean? Mm. So it means mm, that, so I did a picture. What does it mean? So if I <clears throat> choose my, uh, this infinite block matrix, if I choose a random instance of this matrix, it would mean that with the probability one, the norm of this matrix is decided at some finite, uh, uh, at, at some finite, uh, uh, at some block lambda, okay? So for some finite T, basically, okay? So this is uh, the result which I call theorem three. So for both hard random and symmetric hard random setting. So this is just about uh, whether those blocks are Gini Brea or Gaussian or unitary. The with the probability one, there exists finite T such that delta is equals delta of T, okay? So now I'm, let me check what is next. So now I finish the characterization of this model, which we invented, yes? So this uh, uh, block diagonal matrix with some uh, Gaussian or Genebra blocks, blah, blah, blah. We said something about probabil tail probabilities uh, for the norm of, of, this, of this model and also for, uh, mm, for this thing about uh, achieving uh, uh, delta for some finite t. And now we have the actually following conjecture, namely, because I have to go back and connect those results with the results for my har random uh, or symmetric har random sets, which have finite number of elements. Uh, okay, so they are, they are, uh, so this connection is given by uh, the following conjecture that for any symmetric random uh, set in UD, okay, with at least three elements or two elements if, if we have inverses, we have that this tail probability of uh, delta nu s lambda, okay, so this is the really thing which I, we are interested in, which is between zero and one, so the probability that it is bigger than two plus epsilon divided by root of s, I divided by the root of s because of the scaling I did previously. So I have to rescale it back. It's given by the same tail as, is bounded by the same tail as the tail for my model. Okay. This is even written here nicer that probability the delta nu s lambda is bigger than two plus epsilon divided by root s is bounded by from above by the probability that the delta of lambda, so that this limiting object is bigger than two plus epsilon, okay? I will uh, give you a, a, a really a lot of evidence that this conjecture is true. So don't worry that I invented it just to fix it, uh, just to uh, somehow use the previous results and claim that maybe it's true. We actually checked a lot of uh, things numerically. And what is actually even nicer is that if we combine this conjecture with this theorem three, which uh, I discuss here about the finitely and infinitely often, we get a really very nice result, namely that for any symmetric random 
set. So now I can just take three elements or two elements with the inverses and consider uh, the norm of uh, this uh, the infinite matrix which comes from this from from from, uh, uh, from small t going to infinity. So delta nu s. And then this delta nu s will be strictly less than one. So there will be the spectral gap conjecture will be satisfied with the probability one. So delta nu s t is less than one <clears throat> uh, with probability one. Okay, uh, good. So now just uh, for the very end of this talk, uh, three or four slides with the evidence that our conjecture is actually true. So first of all, the first slide, so let's take U4, okay? And let's take lambda six. So uh, T is equal six, uh, and we have nine generators, okay? And we don't have inverses, I believe in this case, or we have, I don't remember, mm, but it doesn't matter basically. So now uh, what is plotted here is the dimension of the representation, so d lambda. So uh, we have quite a lot of representations uh, in this lambda six set, okay? And then uh, the orange thing uh, corresponds to the model, okay? So the limiting object, which I quite well discussed. And the blue thing is actually the true value of the norm of my uh, operator delta, so this delta nu s lambda, scaled by the root of s, okay? So that I can compare those two objects. That's why I'm doing this with scale. So the first, so you can see that this orange is always above the blue. And there is actually a good reason for this because for any finite s, this expected value is, uh, is uh, going to this value and this is going to this and this is always the, the first one is always smaller than the second one there is some finite separation between them and also you can see as you can see that there are some bars on the or, or, so the crosses are expected values and the bars are the variances so the variance in both model yes and uh, in 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 the model and in the actual operator, those variances are rapidly uh, shrinking when we are going with the bigger, uh, with, with, when we are, when the, the dimension of the representation is growing, okay? So this shows you that there is, so if I want to ask uh, now how those two things are related those taste probabilities I will so from this picture suggests that uh, what we conjecture is true uh, okay so the actual picture how it looks like so for example uh, so here we have the histogram of uh, of what so we have now two times eight generators so we have eight matrices uh, and their inverses that's why it's written two times eight we are in the dimension four. So we take the norm of our oper actual operator. It's uh, blue, okay? And we plot the histogram of, of this norm uh, here. And then orange is, uh, mm, orange is this, uh, okay, I should not write this two uh, divided by delta. Of. It's uh, just the, mm, so actually forget about orange because it was for something different. We just need to look at uh, blue and yellow, okay? So you can see that the tail of the blue is always to the left for the tail of the yellow. <clears throat> for this representation, which is complex, for the representation, which is real, and also for this representation, which is uh, uh, also complex because the sequence is not symmetric. And those sequences, those histograms start to be more and more narrow when the dimension of the representation grows. And there is some separation between those things. So I can actually say that probability, okay. So now the actual tails, okay. So the comparison of this quantity and this quantity. So this two plus epsilon and two plus epsilon in both cases. So, uh, <clears throat> 
yeah, once again, blue is the actual thing. So the, the, the blue is uh, delta nu s lambda, or yellow is uh, the model, and orange is actually the bound which we derived. So this bound is absolutely safe. You can see this. Okay. And you can also see the behavior, what is happening when the number of generator grows. When the number of generator grows, we have uh, more and more like uh, yellow is exactly the same as blue. Yeah, because we know that actually in the limit when S goes to infinity, yellow and blue should be exactly the same thing. Uh, due to the first theorem I showed uh, that. Okay, but but you can also see that actually this uh, this convergence happens really rapidly. You don't need a lot of generators to see that those two things are almost the same. Uh, so this is uh, okay. So I don't want to now speak about the proofs of the th of of those theorems uh, which I showed previously because I don't uh, have more time for this anyway I'm like nine minutes out of the schedule so sorry for this this is actually all I wanted to show you uh, so thank you very much and I'm happy to answer some questions if I of course still have time to answer a question yeah thank you Adam for, for a nice talk uh, yeah we are as always like flexible a bit flexible with time so if there are comments or questions uh yeah uh, just raise your hand or like unmute yourself so assume i have just uh because okay like i got a bit confused about like the regimes like what is exactly uh what you were able to prove what is still a conjecture so assume i have say uh you know uh, design degree five and i'm interested in matrices in dimension five or whatever Right, uh, mm -hmm. but I have your model that is I, I I'm I'm drawing let's say high random or like those guys in this fashion that you described. Mm -hmm. uh, for this specific setting, uh, uh, do you provide bounds on gaps for finite C? I guess you do. Yes. Uh, so so, like uh, so maybe this maybe this isn't talk about much or maybe I just <laughs> yeah. So, so the point is that uh, I claim that the bounds which you can use are always uh, those bounds uh, that you get in this in the model. You basically what you are doing. Yeah, yeah, but I wonder unconditionally what you can prove. Let's say uh, unconditionally. So we did it in the previous paper also with Piotr Dulian. We yeah. derived some uh, bounds for this thing, for example. Yes. Oh, uh -huh. The bound for this thing, I can derive an exact bound which uh, do not use any conjectures uh, yeah. whatsoever, using some matrix uh, concentration inequalities mm -hmm. of trop and so on. But yeah. those bounds are horrible because uh, they are completely not true. They scale wrongly because of the fact true. that uh, yeah, logically far. <laughs> yes, no, I'm exactly. laughing. They, they actually, it means those bounds can be used, uh, those bounds of the trope can be used when you know that you have really, I don't know, uh, millions of generators and so on. Yeah. So then those bounds are meaningful. But if you are dealing with a few generators uh, uh, in a large dimension, so for example, you want to ask and about, uh, yeah. which is, let's say, 10. The unitary group is of two qubits, and you have five generators. The bounds which comes from trop uh, approach or applying trop approach. Uh, uh, they are stands, they are just useless. I see. Yeah. So okay. So, 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 them so and we noticed that we actually did experiments, numerical experiments first for for like. Uh, really hard random sets and uh, we uh, actually uh, when i'm saying we all those experiments implementation of those uh, unitary representations numerically and so on it was all done by piotr dulian so uh, and then we saw that actually 
those bands are really very non-exact. Uh, they are uh, they are not sharp, I would say. So we wanted to understand what are the nicer, sharper bounds. And that's why we did all this reasoning with her uh, sure. with random matrix theory. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Uh, any more questions to Adam? Okay, I have one last one last question. So, just when you're doing this, this pedagogical introduction, something came to my mind. So, uh, this uh, let's say the space of. Okay, I'm not sure if this has ever even uh, ever been used, but uh, like you, you emphasize the say polynomials in your presentation, but like often people just talk about gaps and then you don't have clear polynomial structure, right? Uh, so uh, my question is, can one sort of maybe is it do you conceive possibility to use the the polynomial structure of those functions? Right. So, so intuitively, if I have polynomial of degree k1 and polynomial of degree k2, and I I know that I average pretty well on each sort of term, then I should be able to average pretty well on the sort of uh, for the product of them, right? Huh? And uh, yeah. So, so, so okay. So using something like this. Uh... Uh, no, just high level question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. Uh, it would be nice to have such a, of course, if you take the products of these polynomials, they will, you can put them uh, into, um, <clears throat> I, no, maybe I, it's I, for after, for, for offline discussion. Maybe. Okay, so maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's discuss this. Uh, later i would say okay i see that yeah yeah he wants to talk uh to, to his students so i need to run uh yeah many thanks again uh, adam for a nice talk uh, maybe the last sentence which i wanted to say no no, no pardon michael take your time it's nothing urgent take your time take your time no, no problem i did not realize that you were there sorry uh, sure. uh, okay so one thing i this is the reference to the paper so you can, if you are interested, you can read more details or even I know, come and speak with me about the details uh, at any time. And the other thing is that this conjecture, which we have here, it's actually, I really don't mind if you prove it. <laughs> so, uh, anyone, anyone is invited to prove the conjecture. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat because I got distracted for. Uh, no, no, I was just time. saying that I would be very happy if someone proves the. Code. Okay, cool, of course. Okay, with that, let's conclude. Uh, let's thank Adam again. Uh, let's thank Adam again for a nice talk.